sure you've done problems like this many times before. Indeed. You think? Yeah. I Not think just so. you, Miss Stewart. Well, I'm talking yeah. to the people watching. Yes. So, I mean, this is a little funny because there's a fraction here, and it's a couple of fractions, and then I have to distribute this thing. So I'm just going to begin by distributing. Of course, you know, there's more than one way to solve these problems. As always. But I'm just going to distribute. And actually, I'm going to, if it's all right, I'm going to write this. I, I really know that this x is upstairs. It's a very minor point. Sometimes it confuses students, but really this guy is upstairs. So I have that. I'm going to distribute one-fifth uh, over these two terms here. So... That's one fifth x or x over five. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Very nice. Um, really, if you want to think of those guys as over one, that so you're multiplying the top times the top and the bottom times that's the bottom. That's what I'm doing. Right. And then I have one fifth times two, also known as two. Two yes. fifths. So multiplying numerators, multiplying again. Yes, minor thing, but sometimes hey, you just have to be reminded. Yeah. The tops get multiplied. The bottoms get multiplied. Beautiful. Um, equals ten. Right. Love it. Uh, everybody happens to be over 5 here, which oh, is kind of nice. So I'm thinking if I multiply everybody by 5, I can actually get rid of these denominators. Ah, uh, yeah, because fractions, a lot of people don't like working with yeah. fractions, so why not get rid of the fractions? Uh, that's what I'm thinking. I'm liking so I'm going to multiply this side by 5. Really, everybody gets multiplied by 5. Of course, you know, when I multiply, oops, when I multiply this guy by 5, I can really make one out of it. I have a five upstairs and a five downstairs. So you're dividing. I'm dividing. When I multiply this guy by five, same thing happens. Same thing. Five, five. When I multiply this guy by five, same deal. Lovely. Don't forget, that I'll multiply this guy by five also. Very nice. So really, I just have a three x plus x. Is this getting too messy for you? No, it's beautiful. Minus two. I had a little bit funny with them. I mean, really, a Oh, we're with you there. All right, thanks. Minus 2 equals 50. Oh, and now it's a much easier problem. No fractions. I'll combine my x's for x, and I'm going to move this 2 to the other side. 52 divided by 4, divided by 4, x equals 13. Very nice. Is that working for you, Mr. Stewart? So, bottom line, when you have fractions, the easiest way to go is just to get rid of the fraction by multiplying everything by that denominator. Absolutely. Yep. Lovely. Let's look at number two, shall we? It's kind of like number one, except that we have a decimal. Yeah. But aren't decimals other ways of writing fractions? Last I checked. Just for fun, what, this is two tenths, right? So I could, if I wanted to, think of that as a fraction. Two tenths times x equals x minus 1. Well, heck, now I can do it the way you did, Mr. Haas. Let's just get rid of that denominator. If I want to get rid of that 10, I can multiply it by 10 over 1. Of course, whatever I do to one side, I have to do to the other side, and you have to distribute that to everything. So here we go. Those 10s divide out. So I have 2x equals 10x minus 10. Now, did I really have to write that step? I, I didn't really need to. I mean, as always, there are lots of ways to do this. I could have just embraced the decimal, but since we're not working with calculators, that could get tricky. Or I could have just said, heck, how could I have gotten rid of that decimal? How could I move the decimal one place to the right? I can multiply everything by 10. So what, however you like thinking about that works. Now I think we're fine here. I'm just going to subtract my 10x. Get my x's on one side, everything else on the other. Divide by negative 8. And simplify. Yeah. Boom. Looks right. terrific. Nice and simple. Same ideas with the fraction. Just get rid of that decimal, make it an easier one. Thank Here's you. a lovely quadratic to factor. That is lovely. That's a good one. It's a little bit tricky, perhaps, mm -hmm. because you'll notice this first uh, term, the first coefficient, is not 1. Right. Yeah. It's not just x squared, it's 6x squared. So this can be a little bit trickier, but I think it will still factor nicely. So the good news is, of course, this last guy is a 5, and, and I know that these last two terms, something times something, must be 5. So I'm thinking that's pretty much going to be 5 and 1. Very nice. All right, those are my only choices. 5 times 1, that must give me 5. These first guys, something times something, must give me this first term. Well, I don't know if it's 6 and 1, or what else could it be? 2 and 3. 
3 and 2, 1 and 6, I really don't know. I'm just going to try something out. Just what do you think? You, you let me know, Mr. Rubber. What should I try first? Just throw in a 6x and a 1x. Okay, let's, let's just see what happens. 6x and 1x. And now I'm just thinking, like, when I, when I multiply this out, is there any way to get back this original uh, function that I wrote? So this is uh, 6x, so the first term works, the last term. The middle term, of course, comes from multiplying the outers and the inners. So if I multiply 6x times 1, that is 6x, the inners are 5x. Is there any way to get a 13 out of a 6 and a 5? Like if I add them or subtract them, should be going to give me 11 and 1? I don't think so. No, I don't think that's going to work. So that's it. I mean, I just gave it a try. It doesn't work. So now what I'm going to What if you throw the 6 in with the, uh, in the other place? Yeah, so what if I'm going to write the whole thing? 6x. So what are you suggesting, Ms. Stewart? So just keep the 5 and the 1 where they were. They have it like this, 5, 1, now I forget. Right, and just throw the... the so that would be 1x. X. And the, that one is 6x. Well, again, I'm just going to give it a try. Why don't you throw an x there? Oh, yes, thank you very much. Yeah, let's right. just see if that's going to give me a third. So term. again, I know the first terms are going to work, and the last term is going to work. So let's try the middle guy. So I have at a 1x and 6 times 5. No, 30. Yeah, 30 and a 1. No way. There's no way to get a 13 out of that either. Okay, so I guess the 6 and the 1 are out of there. All right. So we're faced with a 2 and a 3. Let's just try something. Let's All right. try 2x. What the heck? And 3x. Beautiful. The first terms work, the last terms work. So my outer is uh, 2 and 15. Ah, yeah. 2 and 15 can give me a 13, but I want a negative 13. So what do you think I want to make negative? Here? Well, I'm thinking you want the 15x to be negative. Yeah. Good. But let's make sure. Does that let's negative that 5 and a positive 1 give me a negative let's 5? Okay. Let's so, yeah. So when I multiply the last guys, I do get a negative 5. And let's try the outers and the inners. So I have a positive 2x minus 15x. I just made a negative 13x and I'm done. And you're done. Yeah. So, you know, the thing about these is you just have to dive in and do guess and check. You know, it seems like I'm kind of guessing and checking here, but really, I mean, I went through every possibility, but really you have to do a bunch of them, and you know, you do get better and better. Yeah. I mean, you I kind of have a sense of what works. Yeah, I know you and I don't have to go through this guess no, and check, don't. because we've done a million of them, Plus perhaps the literally. Right. So that helps. <laughs> All right, but, yes, guess and check, right, right and true. Here we go, let's solve a... Uh, Cubic, I think. This is a cubic. It is. Right. Yeah. Hey, a cubic, that means I'm going to have probably three solutions. Yes. In fact, there are exactly three solutions. One might be imaginary, some could be the same. The same. Sure. And this, I think, actually does have three, three. distinct right. answers. But, here we go. I think I'm going to factor first. Of course, with factoring, you always want to look for your greatest common factor. Yes, good always call. Sometimes students forget, but these rules still apply. They look for the greatest common factor. Look Absolutely. Look for the greatest common factor. You remember that, Anne? I do. Union okay. label. Right. Union label. We're the same age. Okay, so I factored out that x. But I'm not done factoring. Let's factor that nice quadratic. Don't forget about this poor little x. That x is still part of the factoring. I'm going to set up couple binomials here. This goes back to what you just were doing with the factoring, right? I need to look for things that multiply to equal 5x squared. So it's got to be a 5x and a 1x. Things that multiply to equal a 3. It's got to be a 3 and a 1. I don't know. Where should... Okay, I'm going to use my sense of... Okay, I want a 16 here. I'm going to try to put the 3 there because that's going to give me a 15x, right? And a 1 there. That's going to give me a 1x. Sometimes I even write down my outer and my inner. I'm feeling good about this. What about you, Mr. Uh, yeah, that looks good. They both have to be negative. So let's double check. Negative 1 times a negative 3. Yes, that's going to work for me. Now, if you hadn't seen that right away, you would have put a, maybe put a 3 here and a 1 here. You would have quickly discovered that doesn't work. Try it the other way, right? Okay, I've got three things that are multiplied to equal zero. That means that each one of these... Right, and again, I think sometimes students forget, zero. like, wh what is this about? Why does this work? You know, what's so special about this? Like, does it ha do you have to set it to zero? I yes. mean, or what if it was set to one? Would it still work? No, no, because the thing that's cool about numbers, when you multiply 
two numbers together and if you equal zero, that means one of them, or both of them, have to equal zero. It's unique to zero. I have three things that multiply to equal zero, that means at least one of those has to equal zero. For this to be true, x can equal zero, or 5x minus 1 can equal zero, or x minus 3 can equal zero. That's going to produce my three solutions. I'm already down there. Here, let's just get my x by itself, divide by 5. There's my second x value. And here, add 3 to both sides. There's my third. And you know, when we're talking about a solution, sometimes we forget that what that means. That means if I were to plug in 0 into this original equation, I would get blah, 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 0 equals 0. If I were to plug in 1 fifth into this equation for x, I would get 0 equals 0. If I were to plug in 3 into that original, I'd get 0 equals 0. These all make that equation work. Yeah, and if you drew a picture of this thing... Right. What would be true, Ms. Stewart? Yes. What would yeah. be what would be true about what would be special about those x locations? The thing that would be special about those. Whoops. What the heck am I doing? The thing that would be special about those is that they would be the places where the y value, if I set this equal to y instead, was zero. In other words, where it crosses the x-axis. That's terrific. Right. There's your x equals zero. Your x equals one fifth. Your x equals three. Yeah, we call those the roots of that equation. Now, this is another funny question. Sometimes I get mixed up. You know, sometimes like there's like a, instead of factoring out x, let's say I factored out like a number. Sometimes like oh, yeah. like three goes into everything. Like what if I factored out a three instead of an x? Right. Is that is three also a solution? I well, think. Let's, you know let's what I mean? Sometimes students get that a little bit mixed up. Do you know what I'm asking, Mr. I totally okay. know what you're asking. So let's say we had, you know, like. 3x squared minus 12 equals 0. Okay? Yeah, totally exactly. Totally no problem. I'm factoring. I factor out a 3. Right? Oh, I can keep factoring. That's the difference of perfect squares. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Same thing here. I have three things that multiply to equal 0, so one of them or all of them equals 0. Well, does 3 equal 0? Oh, I guess that can never be true. That can never be true. Right. Three yeah. not equal so three zero. is not a solution. So three is not a right. solution. Right. Okay. But these guys are obviously our two solutions would be two and negative two, and when you go back to the original, it's a quadratic, so it will have exactly two solutions. And thanks for explaining that. Yeah, That's I know you were confused okay. about that. We're going to go for the common denominator method on this one. Here. I think that's yeah. tried and true. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, more than one way to do this. I mean, I could have yeah. moved this over to the other side and then cross-multiply. I don't really even like saying that. That's why I did that air quote. <laughs> yeah. So, common denominator. Well, the good news is, really, uh, I just have this one denominator to worry about. So, I just have to make this guy two. I just put it over one. Is that all right? That's beautiful. I just have to make this denominator an x minus four. Fantastic. So, I'm going to multiply the top by x minus four and the bottom by x minus four. Yeah. Shall I? Uh, I think you shall. You have to distribute, of course. So, the top becomes two x minus eight. Beautiful. Over x minus four. Everything else stays exactly the same. 4 over x minus 4 uh, equals x over x minus 4. Beautiful. Now what do you think, Ms. Stewart? Hey, this is kind of like problem one. I've got a denominator that's annoying. Right. Can I just the, get rid of the denominator? They're all the same, so in fact, I can get rid of all of the denominators. I can really just cross them all out, and of course, you know what allows me to do that? You're just multiplying everything by x minus well, I mean, four over one. Do I need to write one. that out and do sure, the whole step? I mean, if I were to if I were to multiply everything by x minus four, this guy by x minus four. Goodbye. Okay, yeah. This guy by x minus four. Goodbye. I guess I should put in parentheses this guy. I don't think this is looking messy. Really. No, that's fine. X minus four. <laughs> Get rid of that. Very nice. Yes, thanks. I mean, it looks like a mess now, but anyway. No, it's fine. Basically, you're doing what we did in problem one. You multiply That's to get rid of the denominator. Anyway, I'm left with this numerator here. Uh, 2x minus 8 plus 4 equals x. Well, now it's trivial. Yeah. All I have to do is move my x's to one side. I think I'm going to subtract x from both sides. Okay. That gives me an x 
Fantastic. We're going to combine those guys, which is a negative, negative four. four. Now, can I move it to the other side of the equal sure, sign, or is that freaking you out? No, I think we can handle that. Okay, so that's x equals four. I think I'm done here, but wait a second. I think, you know, you, you remember, whenever you, whenever you have uh, x in the denominator, like I do here, I really want to make sure that this solution works. I want to make sure that I don't end up with something that's undefined here. Right. And I, I think I can pretty easily see what's going to happen. If yeah. I plug this x in, I'm sorry, this 4 in, this x, I can see that I'm going to have 0 in the denominator, here and here. Right. What does that tell me, this story? That tells you that there is no value of x right. that makes that true. So in fact, it looks like it was a solution, but in fact, this function happens to be undefined here at 4, so there is no solution. Yeah, so we sometimes call that an extraneous solution. You know, it arose correctly right. from the algebra process, but it actually is not a real solution. So and there's actually, no solution. If I were to graph this thing, and you'll, you'll be, this is a rational function, and maybe you've even graphed these before a little bit. Yeah. But this, but 4, when x equals 4, would be a place where this function does not exist. In fact, there would be an asymptote. An asymptote. Say that word, that's so fun. Asymptote. Yeah, asymptote. It's great. Yeah. Thanks. Fabulous. Well done. Correct. Here we go. This is always tricky when people say oh, solve for x, but but there are a's and b's. Yeah, in a situation like this, when you're asked to solve for a variable and there are other variables, that means you're just getting x by itself and everything else on the other side of the equal sign. Right? You're defining x in terms of a's and b's in this case. So let's see. I guess I'll start by just bringing my x's over onto one side. That's always a good place to begin. So I have ax minus x equals b. Hmm. Now this is a little tricky because there's a little 1 in front of there, but those are not like terms. I can't easily combine them. So what can I do to get x by itself? Do you have any ideas? No, we've, we've been factoring a bit. Perhaps ah, factoring might help right. us out a little bit here. I think so. Look, factoring, if I factor out the greatest common factor of x, what that's going to do for me is pull out that x and allow x to be isolated. So I just factored out x, and now I think you see where we're going. Now I can just divide both sides by that a minus 1, and I am done. I have x isolated, I have x defined in terms of a and b. This is going to be a recurrent theme, I think, yeah. in this class. You're going to have a bunch of things where you're going to have to get all of the somethings to want all the x's in this case. Everybody with an x go to one side, factor out that x, and you'll divide by what's left. Yeah. Basically, yep. Exactly. You're going to yeah. see this over and over and over again. If you cannot combine like terms, factor out the thing you're wanting to isolate. And you know, Mr. Haas, when I was learning algebra, I don't think they, they teach this this way anymore. But when I was first learning how to combine like terms, like 3x plus 5x, when I was first learning that you could call that 8x, the way I was taught is you factor out the x, you're left with 3 plus 5, 3 plus 5 is 8, and there you go. That is actually a great way to think about it and yeah. a great way to learn. I mean, you know, sure, absolutely. It becomes obvious then that you can add. Right. So in a situation five, yeah. like that, if you have something like that, there I'm not sure if they're like terms or not, but if I factor out the factor x, out it becomes the x, obvious that you cannot add. Yes, it's great. Yeah. All right. Thanks.